do a little introduction. So uh, first of all, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I'm really pleased that there was such an appetite to come and talk about some running related things um, this evening. This is um, not exactly the uh, kickoff to convention education sessions we were all envisioning um, earlier this spring, but conditions being what they are, uh, we thought this was a nice way to um, bring some of the content we would have uh, had in Portland um, live to you right now. Um, just a couple uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, I see everybody mostly is following the, the um, instructions from the email I sent earlier today, uh, asking everyone to remain on mute while the presentation goes on. Um, if you, I, I imagine at this point, most of you have been in a Zoom session before, but at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat um, button. Uh, if you um, think of a question that you'd like to have and, and uh, that you have and want to ask uh, later on at the Q&A portion after Kelly's done presenting, um, please type it in there. I'll keep an eye on that um, and we'll kind of make a list of um, people to call on um, when we get to that part of the presentation. Um, if there's some repeat questions, I may call on one person to kind of ask that um, just to keep things streamlined a little bit. Uh, if you have other, um, if there are technical issues or, or something's going on that I need to know about, I'll also kind of be as a moderator monitoring that too. So just type that into the chat window um, and I can get to that. So um, it does seem like everyone's on mute and has paid attention. Uh, again, this is also being recorded. So we'll, we'll try to make this available to you once um, it wraps up if you're interested in um, following up on anything, or maybe if you don't catch anything too, that that'll be a, an option as well. Um, and so with that, I would like to introduce our wonderful speaker. Um, this is Kelly Richards, who I hope many of you have met before. Um, and uh, if not, this is you're, you're in for a, for a treat. Um, she's been a member of the Lake Grapevine Runners and Walkers um, since moving to Texas uh, in 1998. Um, she's served in the club uh, in nearly every capacity, uh, is a multi-term president. She's been a race director um, on, on various committees. She's a social media uh, maven for the club. Um, so she's got a lot of experience in um, all uh, club roles. Um, she's been a RCA, was an RCA board member for eight years um, and is now back as club president. So uh, has an interesting perspective on how things have changed from a technological perspective between her two tenures. Um, and I also just want to extend a, a thank you on our end. Um, I, I, Kelly, uh, when she transitioned into this role as president, noted that this was a, an area that she needed, felt was, 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 was not uh, maybe explained or she, she didn't really know about um, in these transition responsibilities and felt that there should be an education session. And so we said to her, well, why don't you do it? So she's here presenting now. Um, and uh, she also was instrumental in suggesting that we offer these as virtual sessions to everyone. So um, really she's taken the initiative and we owe her a, a big thanks for doing that. So without further ado, uh, take it away, Kelly. All right, so I think, um, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here and uh, if, uh, you missed the moral of uh, the story so far. It's uh, if you have an idea, don't share it unless you're willing to execute it. <laughs> so, um, if you if you have a suggestion, most likely you're going to uh, end up uh, having to you know take it from idea to implementation. Uh, so, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with our information. Uh, but first, uh, you know, a couple kind of uh, a, a ground rule. The, you know, a lot of the examples I'm going to give are things that happened, you know, with the running club that I um, am honored to be the president of. Some of them are things I know that have happened at other clubs. Uh, but some of the things that you hear today might have you kind of slapping your forehead and going, no way that did not really happen or they weren't really that silly that they were doing those things well you know the reality is we really were that silly um and it was almost it was never with ill intentions it wasn't because people uh were bad or people were scamming um it's just a lot of times it was things that either weren't thought through very well or just weren't considered at all. Um, but the good news is, is 
we've fixed a lot of these things and um, we're smarter than we may have sounded at one time. So reserve judgment of uh, anyone from my club, please. That's my, that's my request. Because uh, a couple of, again, you're going to hear a few things and you're going to be like, whoa. Um, but with that, I'm going to jump into the um, actual presentation. And so, uh, because I'm going to find it distracting, I'm going to actually uh, hide my face so I can focus on the screen here. And um, Andy, you guys can see the screen still? We can. You may want to just uh, nix your, your uh, uh, you got the volume on the bottom of your screen right there that you may want to just close down so it's not blocking the. Uh... You need my volume higher? No, sorry, the, the icon for your volume is, is uh, on the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. There yeah, we go. There you go. Yeah. All right. Um, so you are here um, at a RRCA club college course. That means you're going to leave with your brain full of uh, great information, hopefully. So uh, Andy already introduced me, but you know who am I? Uh, K2 is my running nickname. Kelly is my real name. Um, I'm from the North Star State of Minnesota, but I live in the Lone Star State of uh, Texas. So you know I'm not sure what that means, other than uh, I'm a little confused and obviously a star, right? A star in my own mind, without a doubt. Um, but. Uh, I'm not sure I'm a star in anyone else's name, but moving right along. So the first few things I wanna talk about is what it means to manage a club. And it's when you're the leader of a club or you're on your board of directors, it can be broken down categorically to um, governance, which I'm going to define governance as um, talking about specifically uh, bylaws. And bylaws are the legally binding rules that outline how the board of a nonprofit will operate. This includes the size of the board, how it will function, roles and duties of directors and officers, rules and procedures for holding meetings, electing directors, and appointing officers, and other essential corporate governance matters. Policies and procedures. They are formulated or adopted by an organization to reach its long-term goals and are typically published in a booklet or other format that is widely accessible by the board. Policies and procedures are designed to influence or determine all major decisions and actions and all activities take place within boundaries set by them. Procedures are the specific methods employed to express policies and action for day-to-day -day operation of the organization. Financial management includes ensuring adequate income, exercise control over spending, safeguarding assets, and reporting financial status to appropriate internal and external audiences. Board members are ultimately responsible for the financial well-being of an organization. And while they do not need to be experts in financial management, they do need to take a general interest in the financial status of the organization they are serving. Committees. They are the working units of the organization designed to make full use of time expertise and commitment of board members to address issues and achieve goals. Practices and traditions. These are the customary activities of an organization. Practices and traditions are not governed by the bylaws and often are not written into policies and procedures, but that doesn't mean they're not important. I like to say that your practices and traditions, this is your club's vibe. This is the feel of your, your club, whatever that vibe is. And then best practices, those are procedures that are accepted as being correct or most effective. So the things that we're gonna talk about, all of your transitions and your to-dos fall within one of these. Governance, policy and procedures, financial management, committees, practices and traditions, or best practices. 
So you might be thinking right now, I know all of that, but what does transition look like? What do I need to do now that I'm large and in charge? Or maybe you're completely overwhelmed because you weren't familiar with some of the things I've just covered. All right, well, so what are we gonna do? First, before we get too serious, we're gonna remember to have fun. So, uh, you know, had you been getting to hear this session in person instead of through your, um, through the interwebs, uh, you would have been in Portland and you would have been um, having a time with lovely ladies like you see uh, in these pictures. These are from multiple um, RRCA gatherings around uh, the country. All right, back to work. So uh, with our governance, uh, our bylaws. So the bylaws, what do you need to do with bylaws? Well, first, you need to have a copy. You, when I say you, you, the president, you, any board of director needs to have a copy of the bylaws. You need to know, uh, you personally should have a copy or access uh, to them. You wanna bring those to your meetings, but you also, you wanna know where uh, are these housed? Uh, do you have a business book, uh, you know, like a physical paper copy? Do they live in the cloud? Are they on your website? And by the way, does the RRCA have a copy of your bylaws? Because if your club is a member of the RRCA, uh, it is uh, required that the RRCA have a copy of your bylaws. And Articles of Incorporation, state and federal laws. Those are all governance uh, that, that you're responsible for uh, knowing and following. And obviously, those change uh, based on wherever it is that you are based. Uh, your, your bylaws, um, remembering, keeping that they are legally binding. Um, I sometimes hear that uh, bylaws don't have to be followed because the board itself has the ability to change the bylaws. So since they can just change them anyway, they're like, well, do we really have to follow them? Yes, you do really have to follow them. And if you want them changed, then go through the process of changing them so you can then follow them. Um, now, when I say that the board has the ability to change the bylaws, uh, usually members of um, the running club also have to vote on those changes. I'm not an expert on each person's uh, bylaws, so I don't wanna uh, indicate that, um, that the, the board can just go ahead and change them, uh, you know, like willy nilly. But the point here is know your bylaws. You don't have to have them memorized. You just have to be able to reference them. Um, I find, it's quite surprising how often I have to refer to uh, our bylaws. So I make sure to have them at uh, every meeting that I attend. All right, policies and procedures, the legal stuff. Whoa, a lot of words here, right? That's what I, when I look at this, like a lot of words. Um, so these policies and procedures, um, these are the types of things that your uh, policies and procedures from a legal standpoint that your club should have. Conflict of interest, ethics or code of conduct, whistleblower, um, privacy and legal notices, financial management policies. So these types of policies, when it, you, you need to know which ones do you have. Whichever ones that you have, you need what is your process for distribution signing and collecting. So for example, if you have a conflict of interest policy, which you should, uh, if you have that, then you need to make sure when you transition your board that each year the board signs the conflict of interest. So for example, if a board position is two years, then let's just say you change your board in January, then January 2021, 
you signed the conflict of interest, and then January 2022, you sign it again. You, you're, even though you were only elected one time, you sign it annually. So um, any of these particular policies and procedures, if you don't have them, then that's something you would want to put on your to-do list to get them, to adopt these policies. Uh, now, the great news is several of these, possibly even all of them, the RRCA has templates. So we're not, I'm not suggesting that you go and, you know, start uh, from scratch and, and be like, well, gee, I have, you know, no idea how to write a whistleblower uh, policy. You don't have to create it yourself. Go to the RRCA uh, website, find it, copy it, put it, your club's logo on it, and boom, you're done. But again, you'll need to determine where is this policy kept, uh, when is it distributed, which should, uh, again, speaking specifically to conflict of interest, that would be you know, at the first board meeting after somebody gets elected. Uh, where is it uh, actually kept? Do you, does your secretary uh, collect it and scan it and put it on the cloud? Again, do you have a business book? So these are all things to consider. I'm not uh, telling you which way you have to do these things, how you print your documents, store them, etc. You can manage that however is best for your, uh, your club. Uh, but again, these, these particular uh, policies really, um, these are strongly encouraged by the RRCA. And as you can see, some of them are actually legally uh, required. Also, these should be easily accessible uh, to your membership. So if someone, uh, one of your just Joe members wanted to know uh, what the code of conduct is for being a member of your club, that you should be able to provide that for them. All right. Uh, so policies and procedures from an operational standpoint, this is um, very going to be very specific to your uh, club. And here, the things with, so you might have a website, uh, you might have some sort of um, newsletter or e-blast service, constant contact, MailChimp, there's a bunch of different things. And same with your membership and race registration. So what everything here, the common denominator here is that all of these have passwords. And passwords are meant to be changed on a regular basis. Okay, maybe not like if you have a job, at my job I have to change most of my passwords uh, every 30, 60, or 90 days. You don't necessarily need to change them at that frequency, but you certainly don't want to go two decades without changing your passwords. Uh, if you guys could see me right now, you would see the um, little wink I just gave uh, when I said two decades. That was unfortunately not um, a made up example. So, what you do not want to do is come up with some type of password and use it for everything that you have and make it really obvious, like the name of your club or, um, or the name of your founder or something like that. And if you're wondering, well, what would be the big deal? Why do I have to change uh, the password, um, et cetera? Well, there's, there's several reasons. One, because it's a responsible thing to do. Um, and also, your, uh, like, let's look at your membership and race registration information. That is probably one of your most valuable assets as a 
running club, your, who, you have information on who is a current member, who is a past uh, member. You have, um, you know, depending on your record keeping, you may have thousands of people from over the years who participated in your races. That information has a lot of value to other people, such as other races, other race directors. So, you know, perhaps there could be a scenario where somebody was a member of your club and they were a volunteer race director. They did a fabulous job. They were a wonderful member. They still are a wonderful member. <clears throat> um, we'll just refer to this person as Joe. And then Joe goes um, and gets the wonderful opportunity to become a, uh, I'm using air quotes, a real race director, somebody who gets paid to be a race director. And Joe's just starting out because Joe does, you know, it's the first time Joe's ever been uh, a paid race director and, and it's a new organization. And Joe's like, well, hmm, who, who am I going to reach out to to market my race to? And then Joe's thinking, scratching his head, and then he's like, oh, you know, there's that really nice uh, list of data of two, three, five, ten thousand racers over at my running club. Oh, I just wonder if my password still works. And if you haven't changed your password, voila, Joe has access to your data. That's not how your data was meant to be used. Furthermore, you have a responsibility to all of your members and to all of your race participants to keep their information secure. Right? You have an obligation when you collected that information from them. So that's another reason that you would uh, change those passwords. So uh, when it comes to um, what our practice is at this time is we uh, do give access to our uh, volunteer race directors for um, our constant contact because that's where all of our uh, database is of e names and email addresses. And then as soon as uh, the race is over, the, um, the password gets changed. So the, the race director no longer uh, has access to that file. Um, and uh, the other reason you're frequently changing um, your, your passwords is you don't want something, you don't want an unauthorized email to be sent out. Uh, and uh, you, the club leadership, you can determine if you want the race director to have that information. Perhaps you don't want the race director to send out any communication because you want to make sure that communication is board approved. Again, that's within your policy. What you're, you're going to make that determination. Who is allowed uh, to send these communications out? Um, and then board of director email. So like my my running club, we have emails, um, president at lgraw.com, secretary at lgraw.com, director, etc. Then those forward to our personal email address. Uh, but somebody manages that board of director email. Um, and you need to determine for your own organization if your email works like that. Is this one person's responsibility and only one person manages that? Or do you have uh, multiple people? Uh, my recommendation would be that you always have uh, at least two people just in the event of any type of emergency. No one even has to die, but you know, maybe somebody wants to go on vacation uh, or somebody wants to go climb a mountain or they just want to go to the movies and you have something urgent that comes up. And that might be especially true with your social media platforms. Um, if you have 
um, Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter and Facebook. And let's say you, you, you know, you have a typo uh, or something um, has, has happened and the information that you posted earlier in the day has changed. And now uh, in that information needs to be altered or deleted. It needs to be taken down. And if only one person has access to it, you might be very limited in being able to get that information changed. But if you have somebody who's a backup, so in our club, you know, we have somebody who never regularly posts. They don't schedule any posts on Facebook. They, um, they're not a, a regular contributor, but they have the access. If I was in a situation, uh, cause I manage our social media, uh, I could contact her and say, oh my gosh, I." spelled this word wrong, but I'm in a meeting, I can't deal with this, or um, something's changed, can you delete that message? I have that person that we can, we can reach out to. And again, with all of these different types of um, things that are controlled through an, through an access level, uh, you want to make sure that you have a running list of all of these things. Um, you want to have documented what all those passwords are so that you don't forget. And then you wanna know who has the um, ability, access and authority through either the way the account was set up or through the policies of the club to change uh, these different passwords. So the takeaway here is to determine who should have the access, who does have the access, and are you changing those passwords on a um, regular basis? Couple more policies and procedures to talk about. Uh, charitable giving policy. Uh, I threw this one in here specifically because I think this is so hugely important. Um, does your club have a charitable giving policy and do you, or you, again, the leadership of the organization, are you familiar with that giving policy? This will guide you to make sure that whatever um, monies you are donating fall within your charitable giving policy and you are not making decisions uh, on a whim or you're not making, you know, uncomfortable decisions because uh, I don't know about you, everyone else, but uh, I feel like people are asking for our money a lot. <laughs> a lot of people want our money or they want to use our assets. Uh, they want to use our, our timing clock or a banner or our chairs or um, some type of thing that our club owns. And when we didn't have a policy, it would get real, uh, it could get awkward and it could get uncomfortable with who do you say yes to, who do you say no to, what are you basing it off of? And um, chances are everybody ends up getting a yes or everybody gets a no. It, it was all one or all the other. But your charitable giving policy will um, guide you uh, with that. Then um, dating, this is, you know, you might want to have a policy about this. Are your um, members allowed to date each other? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Everybody, this is the time to make sure you guys are all still paying attention and you haven't um, actually fallen asleep. Um, I do not recommend having a uh, official dating policy. This is a joke. Um, but kind of uh, with your races, uh, similar to your charitable giving policy, there's some things with races. Uh, do you have a policy on your races, what your, um, the, what your budget is? And uh, do, does your race director have to submit uh, a budget? Uh, how is that? Um, determined or do you do you just allow your race director to 
um, you know, spend as much money as they think is necessary. Uh, I'm not telling you what the policy should be. Uh, I'm just suggesting that you have a policy. And in my club's situation, our elections happen to be uh, in the summer. We change out half of our board uh, one year, and then we have two-year terms. Half the board one year, the other half the board the next year. So half the board could be changing out annually. Uh, our elections are in July, but we, uh, in non-pandemic years, we have a race in October. So that race is already, you know, very much in motion when the board turns over. So for the new board members, they're coming in uh, while the race is well into the planning stages. They're kind of coming in even past the middle of it, but definitely in the, the middle of the hectic season as you go into a race. And for a new board member to have any inkling of what's you know going on financially the budget is how they would uh, know what was going on or how to answer any questions that the uh, race director may have if they were like oh hey i want to you know upgrade these medals or uh, instead of just a um finisher's item i want to give a second item and then you would of course, refer to your budget to know if that was uh, a good idea. And if you didn't have a budget, then you're probably just making uh, an emotional decision. And that is not something I would recommend. And then also with your races, um, your proceeds. So do you want to know who your beneficiaries are uh, and the dollar amount. So does your race have uh, a specific beneficiary? How was the beneficiary selected? Uh, in our club's case, that would go through our um, charitable giving policy is how we would help to determine who the beneficiary would be as well as the donation amount. So that can all be part of your charitable giving policy and then again, the great thing about that is it takes away uh, the emotional decisions because, of course, all charities are, um, you know, the race director probably is very passionate about the charity and um, passionate people tend to, um, you know, especially when they're, they're caring about their, their charity of choice their beneficiary, they're gonna be like, I want all the money to go to the charity. And while that would be fantastic, um, if, your, if your policy is that 25% goes or 50% goes, then it's very um, easy, clear, concise to be able to say, well, we understand. However, this is our policy and as a board, we follow uh, our policy. So while, um, Talking about races and donations, I just wanted to uh, show you guys a couple of, of pictures here. Uh, so my running club earlier, or maybe about a year ago, we got a dry erase big check. So this um, big check, it literally we just use it over and over again. So um, in the past, uh, we were having one made uh, each year for our scholarship. And so for whenever we donated, we did our uh, scholarship presentation, but it cost like $10 or maybe $20 more to get a dry erase, which we've used like six or seven times in the last year. Um, so we either, we only had the big check, which I think we spent like $125 to present it one time because it had the person's name on it and such, or we were doing presentations with the actual physical check. And it was really pretty silly because what's a check, like six inches? Nobody could see it in the picture. I uh, did not make for a great photo opportunity, but you can see here, the big check makes great 
um, photo opportunities. And then we get lots of um, use on it for social media. Um, and it, it gets spread around, it gets lots of attention. And um, this, this young lady in the corner, Claire Reeder, who just a couple of weeks ago got her $2,000 um, scholarship. Um, when we posted a picture of her with the check and there was another picture like with her parents and somebody um, from the running club doing the actual presentation, we got um, our impressions on that was uh, last time I looked, it was uh, over 3,500 impressions. And it, that was not a paid ad or anything like that. We're, we're a club of like 300 people. So having over 3,500 people see this, um, this post brings a lot of attention to our club, to, uh, to our program. And um, you can see from that top picture, that's, um, well, maybe it's not super clear, but we are donating to the RRCA board there, to the Kids Run the Nation Fund. And I definitely uh, will make a shameless plug for the RRCA's Kids Run the Nation um, Fund. And I would strongly encourage you whenever you, um, if, if it's new to your club to have a charitable giving policy, if that's maybe something you're thinking your club needs or already has and um, you want to review it, um, I would really encourage you to any race, every race that you have, some money go back to the RRCA. It can be you know, as little as uh, $25. Gosh, if you could do $100, that would be incredible. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no um, amount they would not accept. So, you know, the bigger, the better. And um, last thing I'll say about the big check, and Andy can verify this story, because I, I flew to uh, Atlanta with that big check. So I flew to Atlanta, then uh, took the train uh, with Andy. And then from there, we had about a six block walk. And I was just walking with this big check and it was blank. And oh my goodness, for that, you know, two hours, uh, I was the most popular person uh, in Atlanta. Every, people were stopping me on the train, on the plane, in the airport, in the hotel. Everybody was like, here, you spell my name this way, or how many zeros can fit on there? So um, if you have a big check and you just wanna feel you know, you have a need to feel really popular, you can just walk around with it. <laughs> so that's my, um, bit, my best practice with um, big checks and doing uh, presentations. All right, financial management, excuse me, one moment. Okay, so when we talk about financial management. What are some of the things that I would be talking about? Well, here they are. Uh, budget, QuickBooks, bank accounts, credit cards, PayPal, Venmo, vendors, and so on. So a transitional piece, uh, again, you're going to need to receive the budget. So again, as I've already mentioned, in my club, we uh, our board changes in the middle of the year, but our budget is written on the calendar year. So as a new board member, if you were coming in, in our case, you come in in July, you're going, but it doesn't matter any time of year that you come in, you're gonna need to receive your uh, approved budget for uh, that year. Uh, the budget, is uh, as everybody knows, you're not um, your your budget is a strong guideline. You might uh, be spending money, uh, you know, outside of your budget, but the budget is a is a really strong guide. Um, QuickBooks, okay, all these other things. The commonality again here is to know. Do these things exist? Do they, does, does your club have them? Okay, my club turns out we had a PayPal account. 
one person knew that. You guys are all on mute, so you, you can't answer, but I bet you might have a feeling who the one person was that knew. It was the treasurer. He was the only person who knew. Now, as it turns out, the PayPal account wasn't being used, uh, and some past board members from previous years, they knew about it. But when I got on the board, no current board members were even aware that this existed. And thankfully, our treasurer is a very high uh, morals and standards and wasn't doing any funny business. Um, but the opportunity was there. So this goes back to knowing what assets your club has, what accounts they have. Uh, bank accounts, uh, a transitional item is you will have to go, uh, well, certain people, uh, probably the president, definitely the treasurer, uh, but you'll have to go to the bank and sign your signature cards. Um, for me, it was the first time I had been in, actually inside of a bank in a really long time. Like you actually had to, we had to make an appointment and um, all the signature um, holders had to be there at the same time so um, it took a, it takes a little bit of uh, planning and then uh, debit cards does your does your uh, club allow for uh, debit cards and this is one of those areas where you um, have to be real cautious uh, a debit card is very um, useful if you have uh, purchases that you want to make, especially like your race director, or if you have somebody in your club that buys supplies, especially if they buy them online, uh, they can use, they could, um, in our case, they would contact the treasurer and the treasurer would give the uh, debit card information to the vendor and, um, make the purchase and that way we don't have to reimburse people. However, the interesting thing is if we were to write a check, this is by our club's policy, if we were to write a check of any dollar amount, it needs two signatures. But the debit card, whoever has it, in our case, it's the treasurer, the assistant treasurer, and in theory, as the president, I, I have one. I, I do physically have it, but I've never taken it out of the envelope because I will never use it. Uh, I, didn't active, I didn't activate it, but the treasurer and assistant treasurer could use that debit card. There's nothing stopping them from using it. Um, now, we would be alerted uh, very quickly that, uh, this transaction had taken place, but it would still be after the fact. So if you're thinking about a, getting a debit card, I would really um, caution you to really think that through if that is the best idea after all and how you would manage that process. And then um, same thing with your, uh, you know, your, your PayPal account, treat it like uh, the other things we talked about with changing passwords, making sure only the people who should have access to these things do. And then vendors, you need to know who your vendors are, um, your preferred vendors. Do, do you use certain people um, do, or do every time you want to make a purchase, do you have to get uh, new bids? Um, so that's, again, information that you should get uh, handed off to you. And just because you have an existing vendor does not mean you can't get a new vendor, but you don't want to change who you do business with just because you didn't know who you do business with in the past. Oh, look at this. We have a cute puppy break. Oh, I can hear everybody going, oh. So that little black puppy, that's Ruby. She actually comes home this weekend and she's gonna live with um, Lisa Rippey, who is one of our uh, board of directors. And then on the right there, that's Ms. T and Henry, and they belong to um, Groton. He is our um, Virginia State rep. Oh, 
we needed that break real quick. All right, committees. What you need to know about committees is that there's two kinds. There's a standing and a short term. So standing means that they last and are used over and over. Short term means they're used for a specific task, their duties come to an end. What you need to know in this transitional period is, are there any committees that exist? Are they already formed? What are they working on? What are their, um, what, what, what is their goal? What are they trying to achieve? When is it going to be done? And do you have any, um, you know, policies on your committees about, for example, my club, every committee has to have at least uh, one board member on it. So you would need to know that policy, uh, but you would want to know if any committees exist. Um, all right, so I didn't have a lot to say about committees. And then practices and traditions. So things that would fall under this would be things like group runs, uh, volunteering, like maybe you're running club volunteers at your uh, local marathon, um, the types of socials that you do, your volunteer appreciation event. So again, as a new board member uh, or one that's you know even going to a higher position within the board, you would want to be familiar with these types of uh, things and uh, you would want to be familiar with these practices. Uh, you may be wondering why you do some of them. It's okay to ask, why do we do this? You know, why do we always volunteer at this race? Or how come, you know, we always have our Christmas party in, uh, you know, September. It seems like a odd time of year to have a holiday party. You know, maybe there's some traditional uh, reason. So um, again, you can always, um, change things, but you probably want to find out why you've been doing it the way you have first. Um, sometimes you have new um, uh, board members that come in that are really gung-ho to make changes, and then maybe they make some of the, uh, I don't want to say wrong changes, but maybe they change some things that didn't need to be changed, and uh, we all know some things do need to change, so it's great to have that enthusiasm, but you know, arm yourself with a little knowledge first so you know uh, why things are being done uh, the way they have been in the past. All right. Oh, we got another break already. Look at this is a cute kids break. Aren't they cute kids? Oh, so this one here up on the left is one of my all time favorite pictures with my little uh, niece and nephew who are much bigger these days. Um, and then on the right, uh, that's my niece and her friend. My niece is on the far right. And uh, that was their first year of track. And they were called the Blonde Streaks. I love it, the Blonde Streaks. And then the bottom picture, that's my other niece. And she's still a kid to me. But last November, I visited her in Denver. And she ran her first ever um, race. And you can see how excited we uh, both are in that picture. So. I just wanted the opportunity to share a little bit about my family there. I've got more nieces and nephews, so don't tell anybody I didn't show all of them. All right, what's next? Best practices. So best practices are the activities that ensure your board is compliant with your bylaws, you're following your policies and procedures, your finances are in good order, committees are used for best results, and your traditions are long lived. So by the very fact that you are here um, on this call, I would call that a best practice. You're getting yourself uh, more educated to help set your, uh, your club up for uh, success. All right, what else do we have left? Okay, so the summary. Um, this is what it comes down to. What you need to know and do is you need to know, does it exist? And whatever it is, is it a bylaw? Is it an approved policy and procedure? Or is it a tradition or is it a best practice? Where is it? Where is it housed? Where does it live? Who has access and authority to it? Who should have access and authority to it? How do you get the information? How do you give the information? And when should it be done? 
So if you're thinking, gosh, it could have come down to that, why has she been talking for an hour? Well, because it was more fun that way. And finally, some more pictures from our RCA convention. And I wanted to make sure you knew that we did let, we do let men attend the convention as well. <laughs> that last picture was just a bunch of lovely ladies, but we do let men uh, attend as well. And again, I really um, want to encourage everyone that to attend in our RCA convention in the future if you haven't um, done so in the past. You can see all sorts of uh, characters are there. Um, all different types of people are there. Um, Olympians and marathon winners and race directors. You'll just meet really the most uh, wonderful people. And you'll get information like I've just um, delivered to you in a really fun uh, environment. All right. so. Um, that's the presentation that I have. I, I know I ran a little long and I'm sorry. I didn't think it would take me quite so long. Uh, but Andy, are there some questions I should answer? So uh, important information and, and uh, we started a little bit late, so you're, you're, you're good on time. We had a lot of interesting kind of discussion among members. Uh, there aren't a ton of direct questions, but uh, I know Goody asked a question about, had a question about bylaws. Goody, do you want to sort of unmute yourself and you can direct that towards K2 or, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, what I was wondering is like, uh, when you need to make an adjustment to the bylaws, do you need um, a percent, uh, do you pre-write what your percentage of members have to approve the bylaw change? Does it need to be 51%? Uh, Does it need to be 66%? Does it need to be 75%? Does it need to be 100%? So uh, first off, what we do uh, in all my um, experiences at the club level have been, we have a um, bylaw committee and I've done, we've done it this way at the RCA national board level as well. We've done it multiple ways there, but we have a committee who comes up with the proposed changes and the actual language for the change and then uh, we go by whatever the bylaws say for the uh, organization, and I'm pretty sure ours just uses the language majority, but not, not, not any more specific than majority. So majority would be, I actually think it's just a majority of who votes, not even the whole membership. That, that, that was my follow-up question was going to be, is it a... Um... Is it a percentage of the people who vote or is it a percentage of the people who are members of your organization? Because um, I know that the running organization I'm a member of has over 2,000 people. And if yeah. you get to 200 people to vote, then... To, I'm pretty sure that that's specific to both bylaws and the state that you operate in uh, probably influences that as well. Awesome, thank you, Goody. Um, so I think Janine, um, you had a question about term limits. If you're still here, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and uh, pose that to Kate Kelly? Hi, um, I was just curious to know, uh, here, let me start my video too, so you can see me too. <laughs> um, I was just curious to know if, um, other clubs, we don't have set term limits. We've had uh, board members who have been board members for many, many years. And they bring wonderful uh, history, turnover skills to our board that's really wonderful to have. Uh, but I just wonder sometimes, is there something we're doing wrong that we're not having, um, we're, we're trying to get other people and other ideas and we have some of that, it's like a whole slant, you know, many years and then two years kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know what other clubs do. <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> you know, some, sometimes the very fact that the longer somebody is in position, then no one ever wants to run against that person or take their, you know, take their spot. Um, some clubs, uh, including my own, the, my club has in the past and at the 
RCA national level, there's nominating uh, committees. So those function slightly different at the club level versus the national level. But at the at our club level, you know, we've we've made a nominating committee with a um, combination of regular members and board members and really letting it know that we're you know encouraging more people we do have term limits for officers uh, but not at all board members but for officers so you know you couldn't serve as like president more than two two year terms consecutively so I don't know that there's a best answer. The best answer would be to get an, a long-term person for them to go engage somebody who's new and encourage them to run for their position. <laughs> you want me to tell the old timers that for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Exactly. If I've done that, I've already recruited my next president. <laughs> um. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, and then I see Nathan has a question uh, on dis disciplinary procedures. So Nathan, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, pose that to Kelly, that'd be awesome. Yeah, um, just a question. I, I was just in as president and we had to take some disciplinary actions with uh, in regards to a couple members and in regards to your so-called dating policy and so forth and their actions were detrimental to the club. And I reached out to Gene at RRCA and we got some guidance and the end result was, is they did violate our code of ethics by their actions and what they were doing. Um, you know, posting about, bad mouthing about each other when the relationship broke up, but um, we didn't have anything set. And that's been my year long commitment to try to have some policies governing investigation slash disciplinary, disciplinary procedures and so forth. And I just was getting your thoughts on that. So but essentially it sounds to me like you're talking about um, member accountability and code of conduct. Um, Correct. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes uh, adults forget to act like adults and see, it wasn't such a bad idea that I had about whether or not you want to allow people to date. <laughs> But yeah, um, like yeah so, you know, having a code of conduct, you know, policy, it's one of those things, it's a great policy to have in hopes you never need to use it. But in the situation you do need to use it, you want to have it already existing and there as opposed to coming up with it on the fly. And then, you know, you don't want to end up being accused of, well, you made this policy just because of us. Well, yeah, we did because you acted irresponsibly, but it's something that we, you will have in place going forward. So um, again, I'm pretty sure that the RRCA has a, um, you know, a template that you can, can use. And it's just, it's a, it's a good policy to have. And, and hopefully it's one that's just very rarely happy that has to be put into place. Thank you. So I actually wanted, uh, I think that's the last question, but Sarah from Lakeland. Uh, oh, she, my buddy, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah noted something interesting I thought with uh, um, her, you mentioned your bank and the transition that financial account and, and documents uh, take. So Sarah, do you, do you wanna just share what you put in the chat to, to everyone, just because I thought that was an interesting talking point and Kelly might have some yes. additional thoughts but, too. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I learned this year in my second year of president that I didn't think about was that we kept all of our credit cards accounts the same except one and um, because she left the board. But I didn't, because everything that has happened this year didn't go into the bank to inquire about what should happen until I tried to cancel it. And they said, oh, but you can't, you have to bring in, you know, do the whole signature card thing again. And so we need your minutes that say that you here are the list of people who should get credit cards and that the board approved this list of people and the amount 
at which they can have a credit card so that it's documented in the minutes. And that seems fairly logical. That, that is something that should happen when you elect a new board of officers and you put people in new positions, but it's something that isn't written down in our, how we operate. And so it got missed. You know, Sarah, that's um, a great, that's a great point because you're right. Um, I didn't even think to, sh I forgot that actually happened. We had to do that. We had to um, bring in our, minutes to the bank and as i recall the minutes had to be sent by somebody that was not those of us who went to the bank to get our names on the signature card so like the secretary had to send it to the bank um, the bank com upon confirmation having received it set up our appointment for us to go in and do the signature cards and that's a, a, a great point it just seems very complicated, but yeah, it's, yeah. yeah and it, it was, was actually was like I mean, over. the morning that I went in to do the signature cards. We, it was the craziest thing. We were at the bank for like two hours. It was very weird, I thought. Yeah, so it's just one thing to consider if, you know, if you're changing people every year, that this is a very long and detailed process to get everyone financially set up to be able to do business if you're doing business every single month and you know at a, a fairly good clip like we are so it's it it creates a, a period of where things can't happen um if that's not set up is what we learned thank you so i think that's all the the questions we have we are you know right at an hour right now too so unless anyone wants to jump on the chat and say they want to speak up um i think we can how to wrap up here. Uh, as noted, I, I will also, what I can do, I can save the chat room as a text file that I can share with everyone so that if there's some discussion that went on in there, I know some people shared some interesting information um, on, on that space um, that everyone might want to see. So I, I can make sure everyone gets a copy of that. Um, and then I just want to thank K2 again. This is fantastically well done. So. <laughs> Um, it's not easy to give a presentation with everybody on mute like that. Oh my gosh, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're getting getting lots of virtual applause from everyone. So, Yay. Really <laughs> so. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and I look forward to when we can all be together again and, um, you know, do some running and elbow bumping and <laughs> so we'll see you all later. Thank you. Thanks everyone. All right, good night. Good night.